petroglyphs or images or carvings that you've seen around the world, you'll find in South Africa uh, or in Southern Africa. And the age of these carvings in Southern Africa, because of the kind of rock that they carved into, can very clearly be, be dated to way beyond 200,000, maybe even older than 300,000, maybe even older than that, 1,000 years old. And, uh, and that makes it really interesting, and especially like the Egyptian Ankh. You know, mm -hmm. The Egyptian Ankh is no, longer come, no longer comes from Egypt. We now know that it comes from South Africa. Mm -hmm. The Egyptian Ankh being carved in very, very hard andesite rock with erosion on it that is absolutely, and, and cracks and erosion on the cracks that is spectacular. The link to the Dogon people uh, we have is where you know that they had like these four these four symbols of the four seeds of creation right uh, that the dogon had well i found one of those and i bet they'll be the others will also be there but one of those symbols of the four the incomplete circle with the lines coming out of it at very specific places on that incomplete circle well we've got one of those beautifully carved uh images in the same rocks that we find the the ank and many other pentagons with serpents and stars uh, inside them and all these spectacular images that are just breathtaking and they're extremely old interesting uh in terms of uh quote unquote mainstream science or mainstream uh his historians uh, are there people uh, who are part of the the uh uh, the sort of the more uh, you know classical university uh, realm have, have they embraced your work at all, or has there been any interest, uh, or do they do they shun your work? I mean, where where, where do you fit in, in that continuum? That's very interesting. The scientists uh, love what we do; they absolutely love it and embrace it. And I'm talking from you know astrophysicists to uh, to molecular scientists to um, nuclear physicists. Uh, and and chemical, you know, um, people in chemistry and so forth, they love it or what we do because they can see the scientific arguments that we put out there and then how we build our case. And well, I guess how I build my case at this stage is because at this stage I've sort of separated myself from all the other people that I started doing this research with, and they love what 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 I share with them. What, uh, where we have an absolute rift and uh, what seems to be a, an insurmountable chasm is, uh, is with the archaeologists, the anthropologists, and the, the historians. Right. The, geologists, the, the geologists love it as well. They, they are fully, squarely behind us. We have some of the most senior geologists in South Africa that have come out and, and absolutely um, you know, supported everything that we say and claim about the age and and, and antiquity of these structures. Um, <clears throat> they obviously don't go into who built it, but they tell, they, they prepare to say this stuff is really, really old. It's not part of the bedrock. It's man made and all this kind of stuff that the claims that we make. Um, and But the archaeologists and these guys, unfortunately, there, there's a, there seems to be an insurmountable rift there. We have a, a huge problem with, with the archaeological and anthropological and especially historical departments in South Africa. Yeah. They, they don't. They don't like me. They they try and, and they try and poo poo whatever I do all the time and and discredit the work uh, with their statements and the media and so forth. It's it's very unfortunate. And the, the sad thing is that they've done no research, and I can say this with absolute certainty. They know absolutely nothing about the subjects that we discuss. They've never even been to the sites that we discuss, and yet they prepare to go out. On, on record in public and make statements, you know, derogatory statements about our, our research and our work when they've never even been to these sites and done any any research work there. Well, they, they, I'm sure they have a, a huge amount invested in their story, you know, yeah. and uh, and for them to uh, begin to disassemble their story, well, they'd have to disassemble their entire lives, you know, because it's what they've worked for, which is a reflection on some level on a much more minor scale of what the rest of humanity theoretically would have to do in order to understand the the greater story, the greater implication of your story about who we are, where we where we come from. Uh, yeah, so no doubt about that. Yeah, so they're 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 just the, the 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 most I think severe case of the the front line on that. Yeah, I was doing some research on this and, uh, and on on the on the subject, and one of the things that I came across 
and you may find this fascinating, maybe you've already already seen this, was from the from the uh from the from the creationist camp and how the creationists uh respond to Sitchin in this material of alien DNA and, and alien genetics is that they are not some of them aren't shunning this. Some of them are saying this is actually probably true, but these people are the fallen angels. These people are the, these people are the devils of of the of the world that we're that that we're, that inhabit our world. And so it's, it's an interesting twist. They're not they're not pushing it away. They're saying you know this could be true, but you know but if that's the case though, and we are part of part of that, you know I mean I mean where, where is where is the the Gordian knot, the, the 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 religious Gordian knot. There is it that we have to redeem ourselves by accepting Jesus Christ, and therefore the redemption of our alien bodies and our alien origins uh, takes place. We get absolution, or is it something something different? I, it's a it's a fascinating take on Sitchin and this whole concept of Enki and Enlil and the and fallen angels as as being our creator gods. Have you run across this theory as well? Well, absolutely. You know, Robert, I, I've done quite a few quite a number of, of presentations to religious groups and Christian groups that in, invited me and and what happens is that you know because f at no stage do I ever d degrade or badmouth God or the Creator or say anything negative about Jesus Christ or anything like that in fact I do the opposite what happens is when you present the research and the work that I've been involved in is it actually opens up the whole religious um, box of dogma that many strong, deeply religious people find themselves in. It opens it up and it allows them to see how much bigger and greater the creative process is and how much bigger and greater the divine being or the divine creator or source or God, if you want to use that word without getting confused, how much bigger those those things are. And, and uh, realizing that, that Maybe up to that point they might have been putting God into a box, which in in many instances is the is the case, and and they live in that dogma and that fear. But once you open that up and you show them that this is a much bigger and a much more beautiful process than anyone has ever imagined, and that people like Jesus Christ and and all and many of the other prophets that have walked the earth before and since since him as well have have come to earth to try and share this information with us. Mm -hmm. uh, it, they they feel very enlightened, relieved, but also confused after my presentation, because <laughs> now they get this information. Uh, I don't take anything away from what they've been told. I just show them a slightly different and a bigger op uh, alternative that has limitless possibilities, and now now suddenly they feel confused. What am I? Oh my God! Uh, uh, you know I can't. I can't dislike this guy because he didn't tell me that Jesus Christ is an idiot or God, you know, God is, God doesn't exist. He he told me the opposite, and and I find that a fascinating uh, situation where I I actually enjoy doing this with with religious groups because I find that that the the dogmatic group, the religious groups, are just so um, consumed by fear mm -hmm. that they are, that they just fear petrified of moving out of their little box because they're really scared that God's going to smite them with a laser beam from the sky or something like that. And once you show them that that's not going to happen and that God doesn't want to harm them, that you know the divine being is actually all love and it can be nothing but love, uh, it starts to change your perception and, and could be a life-changing experience. Yeah, <clears throat> no, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, you know, we just had somebody on the line here, and they they went away. <coughs> excuse me, because because you and I were, were uh, uh, deep in conversation. But I, we've got uh, probably about uh, another eight to ten minutes or so on the uh, on the hour that Michael wanted to share with us. Uh, and if you want to talk to Michael, uh, maybe in the next eight to ten minutes, uh, here's the number: it's three four seven three zero eight eighty nine ninety five three four seven three zero eight eighty nine ninety five. And we'll try to get you on and have a couple of uh, questions for Michael before he gets some sleep and uh, gets ready for his uh, next uh, date tomorrow. Speaking of dates, Michael, uh, you're going to be where tomorrow? Uh, at Phoenix, uh, Scottsdale? Phoenix. Yeah, uh -huh. Scottsdale, Scottsdale, Arizona, tomorrow evening. Um, 
and then we move on to Sedona, and then we have to San Diego, then we have to LA, then we up California coast to uh, to San Francisco, Oakland, uh, Sacramento, <laughs> all the way up the coast, right? To Oregon, Seattle, and then uh, then and then we come back across uh, to Salt Lake City, Denver, Kansas, and then eventually Minneapolis and Vermont, and then well, we're out of here. Well, Salt Lake City should be a real trip for you. I mean. You know, you've got that whole Mormon overlay in Salt Lake City, and you know, and they've got their own, you know, fairly interesting creation myths as well. And uh, that should be uh, an interesting cross pollination for you in terms of who you run into and and <laughs> and how yeah. and how, how they work with your material. Well, I'm looking forward to that. You know, it's it's. Uh, what, I mean, what I do is I just present the present the evidence that we've got and. How people react to it is their own thing, and and what seems to be happening is that is is an is an amazing response of uh, resonating with the information. People yeah. somehow are able not to they not offended in any way. In fact, they feel that they absolutely resonate with this information, and they they are able to bring it into their own area of of understanding and their own reality, and somehow plug it in. And allow it to enhance their their own level of knowledge and all that, and w- which is fantastic. That's that's great. Yeah. 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 A- absolutely. I would agree with you wholeheartedly on that. Uh, one of the other things that uh, uh, Janet down in uh, Taos uh, told me is that in addition to the work that you're doing with um, the the calendar and, and the structures in South Africa and the Anunnaki, you also have an idea for a a new society and a new civilization, and I, we don't have a lot of time, and maybe we can save the bulk of that for another interview with you. But I'm wondering if you could touch on that briefly and how that came to you and how that dovetails with the work that you're doing. Well, it dovetails perfectly, and it actually, in a way, answers the question you asked a little while ago about you know about my life, how well, where I come from, what I've done, and so forth. And, uh, what seems to be happening is that my entire life up to now has been a dress rehearsal for what I'm doing today. Mm-hmm. All, the different thing, all the different things I've done, you know, in, in show business, entertainment, studying pharmaceutics, uh, Vitz Medical School, you know, getting in, interested in the DNA and, and stuff like that, and, and then working in television and so forth, allowing me to be able to, to do this work and present it in a way that people that haven't, haven't had the background that I've had would find a little bit more difficult to do. Um, and uh, what, what, what I find is that the, the ancient civilizations that we are now discovering and discovering their, uh, their basic, well, very low understanding of what they did, how they lived, and what kind of energy sources they used, I, I call it like a... Um, that it, it seems to be some sort of a completion of a cycle of prophecy uh, of some sort. You know, the, the first days will be like the end days, and the end days will be like the first days. And our main obsession in the world today is to find energy, free energy, to mm-hmm. liberate ourselves from the oppression and right. to be able to survive w- without having to worry about how we're going to make ends meet at the end of the month. Right. And what, what seems to be the case is that we're rediscovering what the ancients knew, and we, I believe we're very, very close to tapping into the free energy that they, that they left behind for us. It's still mm-hmm. there in large, large numbers. All the stone circles are alive and well and kicking, giving us free energy. We just need to figure out how to tap into that. Now, there are many prophecies, Mayan prophecies and other ancient civilizations of these giant, long period of, you know, cycles of the rise and falls and civilization and so forth and and we're reaching 2012 now, and there are many kinds of predictions about what might or might not happen in 2012, or, or even before 2012, and that many people may die and so forth. And the point is that um, what happens if we have a complete meltdown of the of the system that we have today, the communication system, the uh, the electronic system, the satellites in space, all these things. If if something happens and it's just within a few seconds, it all melts down and it's gone. What happens to the human race? 